1 Corinthians chapter number 1. We'll begin reading in verse number 11. The Bible says, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe. Let me just stop right there. Chloe? Not supposed to be tattletale. Just thought I'd throw that in. That there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you for the scriptures. We thank you, Lord, for the house of God, the people of God. Lord, we're thankful for Calvary. We're thankful, Lord, we can come and worship you in spirit and in truth this morning. Lord, we enjoyed a good Sunday school hour. We enjoy the good singing. Lord, we enjoy being saved. Now, Father, I pray you'd help us this morning. Without you, we can do nothing. And Lord, you alone know the need behind every person's smile that is in here this morning. Lord, there may be some who are really hurting, seeking some answers. I pray they'd find them through Christ this morning. God, there may be some here this morning that's low that need to be lifted. There may be some in here this morning who are troubled. I pray you would, as we just heard in that song, would speak peace in the midst of their storm. God, there may be some here this morning who are hungry, and I pray they'd be filled. There may be some here this morning, Lord, lost. I pray today would be the day of their salvation. Lord, whatever the need is, I pray that, Lord, they'd find Jesus precious to their soul. Now, Father, thank you for touching Miss Sonny. It's good to see her back with us today. Lord, thank you for other answered prayers. Father, be with Miss Lexi today. Touch her and help her. Others, Lord, that could not be here that are providentially hindered, help them. Be with Brother Josh as he's preaching this morning. Use him in a great way. And, Father, help us here this morning. Put a hedge about us. Lord, I plead the blood of the Lamb over this place. Lord, we're looking unto Thee, the author and finisher of our faith, and trusting in You to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Uh, Use this unworthy vessel, Father. We'll thank You for it. For it's in the wonderful name of Jesus we ask these things. Amen and amen. The church at Corinth was a very carnal church. And it is a church full of confusion. Matter of fact, in chapter 14, the Apostle Paul writes that God is not the author of confusion. You see, uh, as this letter is being written, they did not have a complete copy of the Word of God. They were left to their own constraints in many things. They did not yet know how to discern the Holy Spirit And therefore, uh, anything that could go and go on went on in this church. Let's us know that without the authority of the Scriptures, our lives could be in a mess. Now, I want you to notice some things as a way of introduction. We'll get to the message rather quickly, but I want you to notice the contentions in verse number 11. He says, For it had been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. 
Notice he calls them brethren. These are saved folks. These are Christian folks. Nowhere in the scriptures do we find that once somebody gets saved, they're perfect. Matter of fact, if you let your flesh take over in your life, you're going to make a mess of your life too. But there's contention going on in this church. There's division. There's problems. There's arguments. What are they arguing over, Brother Bob? Are they arguing over the cosmos? Are they arguing over uh, uh, some great uh, 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 thing that needed to be debated in that day politically? Are they arguing over... uh, 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 should they have pinto beans and cornbread for lunch? What are they arguing over? No, they're not arguing over those things. They're arguing over who was the instrument that God used to save them and who baptized them. In other words, Brother Phil, they're picking favorites. Hmm? I got saved over so-and-so, so I must be better than you. Hmm? Can I say God resisted the proud but gives grace unto the humble? It doesn't matter who was preaching tonight you got saved. What matters is that the Holy Ghost dealt with you and you got saved. Can I say uh, preachers get a lot of credit based on their personality. It's not about the personality of the preacher. It's not about his method. It's not about his design of a, a structure of a sermon. What matters is whether or not God is using him. He's just an instrument. I've heard loud preachers. I've heard soft-spoken preachers. I've seen animated preachers. I've seen immobile preachers. I've seen everything. And everything. What matters is those that God uses to touch your heart. And God can use whoever he wants. He used a rooster to preach to Peter. He can use whoever or whatever he wants to use. And it's not that man gets any glory. It's always that God gets the glory. So we see the contentions. Now, notice that Paul responds mentioning his call in verse number 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize. Now let me just stop right there. Baptism is important. Baptism is the first step in obedience in the life of a Christian. Baptism is what aligns you with the Lord's church and gives you uh, 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 liberties and privileges for God's people in God's church. Uh, But baptism doesn't save you. Mm. He said, uh, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made uh, of none effect. In verse 4 of chapter 2, he said, My speech, my preaching... uh, was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Uh, Paul said, God called me to preach the gospel. uh, And he called me to preach the gospel uh, in a manner uh, where folks could hear it uh, and understand it, uh, that all their faith would rest in the power of Christ and in the finished works of Calvary. He said, it's all about what Jesus did, not what I'm doing. And he was called to preach the gospel. The gospel simply is the good news of Jesus Christ, that he became flesh and went to a cross uh, and paid for your sin debt, was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. Uh, And friend, if you'll put your faith and trust in him, he'll save you from your sins. That's the gospel in a nutshell. Now notice the clarifying. Look, if you will, in verse 18. He said, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. He's clarifying what God called him to do and why God called him to do it. To summarize it, he basically says the preaching of of the cross to the saved is the power of God. But the proud will perish in their in their wisdom. It's foolish to believe in the intellect and the design and the theories of man and discard the truths of God. Can I say? 
to believe in God takes faith. If all your outlook is based on logic and what you can see, you may be in trouble, friend. Hmm? Because the things of God deal with things we can't see. But those things we can put our trust in. All God wants us to do is believe on Him and believe His Word. I'm interested in what is mentioned throughout this chapter and the next chapter. I'm interested in the cross. There's a lot to be said about the cross. There's one hanging on the back wall behind me. There's one on the front of our church. Throughout the community, you'll find them on steeples. You'll find folks wearing them on necklaces. You'll find all kinds of mention about the cross, but few ever really take time to consider what it really means. What does the cross really mean? And so with God's help, let me give you a few things about the cross. Can I say, first of all, the cross was a designated place. In Revelation chapter 13 and verse number 8, the Bible says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb, uh, uh, slain from the foundation of the world. Can I say, before God ever made the world, he already designed a place that would have a cross. Can I say when God did make the world, He formed a little uh, 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 hillside outside of Jerusalem, uh, 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 a place called the place of a skull, uh, where He knew that He would die on a cross. Uh, can I say long before the cross was ever set in His place, uh, He grew the tree uh, that would become the cross, uh, that He would pay uh, the sin debt of all mankind uh, when He hung there and bled and died. It was a des designated place. Uh, it ever humbles me to think uh, that the great God of glory uh, in His holiness, uh, in His greatness, uh, in His sovereignty, uh, uh, one day uh, made up His mind He'd make the worlds, uh, and one day made up His mind that He'd form man from the dust of the earth, uh, and and he'd breathe in man's nostrils the breath of life uh, and man would become a living soul uh, it ever boggles my mind to think that he put man in a perfect environment uh, and give him one law uh, just one law to keep uh, and then when man broke that law uh, and sin came into this world uh, and death by sin uh, why God didn't just uh, wipe man off the face of the earth I know not uh, but God uh, in his compassion still He'll reach out to fallen man uh, all because he'd already designated a place uh, where before he ever made the world, uh, before he ever made man, uh, he knew he'd go to a cross and pay for the sins of man that he was yet to even make. Uh, it was a designated place. John 19, 17 says, And he, bearing his cross, uh, went forth into the place called the place of a skull, uh, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. In the Greek, it's called Calvary. And I say it was a designated place that he formed, that he knew he would go to, and in John 19, he did that very thing. He bore his cross up Calvary's mountain. It was a designated place. Can I say something else about the cross? It was a devastating place. Nothing good ever happened up there on Calvary. Calvary was a place that would mark fear in the hearts of all that passed by. Calvary was the place where you was to bring your children to show them, uh, uh, don't you dare break the law. This is what happened to you. It was a devastating place. Can I say, in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13, the Bible says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. I say hallelujah. But then it goes on. It says, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. It was a devastating place. It was a place that came with a curse. Those that went there went there because they were a curse. My dear friends, the Holy Lamb of God became our curse when He went to the cross of Calvary. It was a devastating place. Uh, Mark says it in Mark 15, 32, uh, as He's hanging on Calvary's cross, uh, 
uh, uh, the masses came by, they showed no pity. They showed no mercy. Uh, those that he'd maybe changed their lives. Uh, those maybe he healed their children. Uh, those that he might have uh, 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 delivered from a, a grievously vexed devil. Uh, those that he'd done many miracles before. Uh, they came before him not uh, in pity and love, uh, but they came uh, in mocking and in cursing uh, and spitting upon him uh, uh, and in abusing him. Uh, this is what Mark says in chapter 15 and verse 32. Uh, they said, Let Christ, the King of Israel, uh, descend now from the cross uh, that we may see and believe. Uh, and they that were crucified with him reviled him. Uh, hey, uh, they put him to an open shame and mocked him while he hung on the cross. It was a devastating... By the way, if he had came down, they wouldn't have seen and believed anyway. He'd already done enough before them to prove he was the Son of God. And had he come down from the cross, uh, he couldn't have helped them anyway because he didn't pay for their sins. And he would have never helped us because there had been no hope for us. Mm, can I say, it's Christmas time soon. And all over the stores, if you go to stores anymore, I kind of like uh, uh, online and it shows up at my door. Kind of like that. Not going to lie, uh, although you go to Florence Mall, there aren't crowds anymore anyway because there aren't any stores left in there. But uh, if you go uh, anywhere throughout uh, 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 the shopping realm or even if you watch the Hallmark Channel, you might hear something like this. Seeing is believing. You ever heard that? Hmm? Uh, my dear friend, seeing is not believing. Do you know the hand is quicker than the eye? That's why all these magicians astound you. Because their hand's quicker than you can see. And boy, they'll do something and say, Wow, he's got magic. No, he's just got a fast hand. Seeing isn't believing. Hmm? True believing is by faith. True believing is when you can't see and you still believe. Hmm? That's faith. You see... They couldn't see with the eye of faith that day what he was doing for them, and they certainly wouldn't have, saw, wouldn't have believed on him if he'd have come down. Then they'd have said he was of a devil. They'd already accused him of being of the devil anyway. Uh, it was a devastating place. You realize what they did to Jesus on Calvary? They plucked the beard from his face. They had beaten him in the hall of praetorium beyond recognition. They had uh, uh, whipped him with a cat of nine tails uh, and tore the very flesh and muscles from his body. Uh, uh, do you realize uh, they had planted his head with a crown of thorns? Uh, uh, they'd put on him a purple robe when they got to Calvary. Uh, they stripped him naked and hung him and suspended him between heaven and earth. Uh, and they gambled for his garment. Uh, again, they spit upon him. Uh, it was a devastating place. It's a design place. It was devastating. By the way, Brother Donald, that's what should have happened to you and I for being sinners. We should have died on a cross and went to hell. He took our sin, our shame, our suffering, and our hell on Calvary. It was a devastating place. It was a designated place. And I say it was a place of death. No one ever went up to Calvary and was nailed to a cross with any expectation they would live. It was a place of death. They went there to die. It was a death sentence. Death row back then didn't last 17, 18 years till you ran out of appeals. You were sentenced, and then within the week, you was hanging on a cross. Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 8, speaking of Jesus, saying, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. John 19, 30, says, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished, and he bowed his head, and he gave up the ghost. He died for your sin and my sin. 
you know, again, Christmas time's coming. We'll get all excited about the babe in the manger. But friends, he came in this world to die. He didn't come to have angels sing about him. They were singing about him for eons and eons and eons anyway. He came to die. And on the cross, he did that very thing. You see, under the law, there had to be a sacrifice for sins. A lamb had to die. And he was the Lamb of God that died for all mankind's sin, past, present, and future. He came to die. The cross was a place of death. It was a place of devastation. It was a designated place. Can I say some of the other things about the cross? It's a divisive place. Yeah, if you let people know you believe in Jesus, that he died for your sins, and you're thankful for the cross, that causes some contention in itself. That will cause some divisions. Some of you used to run with the crowd, but when you believed on the Lord and you knelt it before His cross by faith, that crowd don't run with you anymore. Some of your family thought you lost your mind, and they're not quick to accept your invitation for turkey dinner. It's a divisive place. The cross is. Jesus said himself he didn't come into the world to bring peace but a sword. Hmm? The Bible says in Galatians 6.12 As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh they constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. You see in that day if you claimed you were a Christian you believed in the Lord the Jews would have you hunted down and killed too. They wanted you to become circumcised and come under the authority of the law. And folks were doing that so they wouldn't be persecuted because of the cross of Christ. It was a divisive place. Philippians 3.18 says, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Can I say? The attack on 9-11... That terrorist attack that came to America, yes, it was a terrorist act by a people who attacked America because America claims to be Christian. Muslims hate the cross. They're the enemies of the cross. They are followers of Muhammad, not Jesus. And their philosophy is destroy everyone that embraces the cross of Christ. Mm -mm. I know it's not popular, but it's right. It's true. Mm -mm. Can I say? They're not the only ones who hate the cross. Mm -mm. There's been a lot of our Baptist forefathers that were slaughtered for their faith because they refused to believe in infant baptism because they refused to believe in a state-sponsored church, because they went to their death clinging to the cross of Christ and Christ alone. It's a divisive place. Can I say something else about the cross? It's a delivering place. Oh, yeah. Yes, no sinner's ever been saved without going by the cross through an eye of faith. Paul wrote this to the same church and later in chapter 15. He said in verse number 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you've received, uh, and wherein you stand. He's again preaching the gospel. Paul was known as a Bible gospel preacher. huh? He went on to say in verse number 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, uh, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, uh, and that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Uh, yes, he died on the cross, but that wasn't the end of Jesus. Uh, three days later, he rose up victorious uh, over death, hell, and the grave, uh, rose under his own power. Uh, we worship a living Savior today. Uh, hey, uh, I'm glad he died for our sins, but he rose again with victory. Uh, hey, what a blessing. 
blessing to know uh, I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and I too have victory over death, hell, and the grave because He lives in me. Ephesians 2.16 says, uh, And that He might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. What sinners don't know is they're the enemies of God. Their very sin puts them at enmity with God. God cannot have fellowship with them because they're sinners and He's holy. Uh, uh, can I say God loves them, but He hates their sin. Uh, and God made a way for them to be saved, but He will not save them in spite of their sin. There's en enmity. But Jesus Christ, through His body that He took to the cross, made a way where sinners could be saved. He took away the enmity by making a way. Mercy built a bridge for us to get to heaven. Colossians 1.20 says, And having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself, by Him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. You see, that enmity, that warfare between the holiness of God and our wicked sin, peace was brought to, uh, to God through the cross. Uh, God made a way where sinners could be saved. I'm glad when he looks at me, he don't see that wicked sin that I, I, I was guilty of because the blood of Jesus Christ gave me a pardon from my sin. He robed me in his righteousness, and now when he looks at me, he sees himself. What a blessing to have peace with God. You know why some people can't sleep at night? They don't have peace with God. Hmm? You know sinners that God won't even hear their prayer until they, if they cry out in repentance to God? And ask him for, they're sinners all the time asking God to save their loved ones uh, from uh, some terrible disease or, or rescue somebody or give them a job or they pray for all kinds of things and they're, they're all in vain. God doesn't hear their prayer until they call on him in faith and ask him to save their soul. Mm. Colossians 2.14, I love this verse. I refer to it often. You see, as sinners, we had no hope. The Bible makes it clear the law, the Old Testament was given. And all the law was given to show us we couldn't be holy in ourselves. Brother Ron, if there's a way you could have earned salvation in yourself, Jesus wouldn't have had went to the cross. But what the law was, it was our schoolmaster. It brought us to the knowledge of sin and realized we couldn't be holy. Hmm? There was all kinds of ordinances and laws and, and rules that we were guilty of. Uh, I've seen Brother Chad and Miss Riley come in. they got that beautiful little girl. She's just, just starting life. She's so precious. But do you know she was born a liar? She won't have a dirty diaper. She's not hungry, but she'll, she'll have a fit just because she wants somebody to hold her and give her attention. She's lying. There's nothing wrong with her. Well, she acted out like she was born a sinner. We all were. Now, what a blessing is, until she reaches the age of accountability, she's not accountable for her sin. Mm -hmm. uh, she's safe in the Lord until she comes to where she can discern the difference between good and evil. But can I say this? The, all those laws were given to show us we were guilty. Mm -hmm. You know, it's pretty bad when you're in a court of law and your only defense is, they're right, <laughs> I was guilty. Have mercy on me, judge. Give me a lighter sentence. But see, the only sentence for a guilty sinner is hell. But I love this verse in Colossians 2.14. This is what Jesus did on the cross. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that were against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. What's that saying? It says everything we were guilty of and all the law that we had broken, he took it and nailed it to his cross. And when we believed on him, all of that is pardoned. What a blessing. It's a delivering place. Had it not been for the cross of Calvary, we'd have no hope. It's a delivering place. I'm glad 47 plus years ago, I got born again because I heard somebody preach the gospel. And I heard somebody preach what Jesus did for me on Calvary. Can I say this about the cross? It's a delightful place. It's a place that Christians glory in. Mm. 
It's a place that I realize when I got problems in my life, I can just go back to the cross. Hmm. The old hymn writer said, Jesus, keep me near the cross. Huh? What a blessing. It's a delightful place that we can go and get the help we need because the blood of Calvary still cleanses us from all sin but gives us hope for tomorrow. But then let me say this about the cross and I'll be done. For a child of God, the cross has a duty. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24, then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You see, Christians are to take up their cross. Christians need to realize their cross is a designed place. There is something God has for you to do. He has designed a plan for your life. We're not just to grope in the darkness and walk aimlessly before this life. We're to find the will of God for our lives. He's designed a plan for your life. Can I say that mm, the cross in your life is a place of death? It's where you died out to sin, and you're to die daily out to sin, uh, and uh, it's, it's a place of death in your life. I'm not what I used to be. Thank the Lord. I've died out to that old man, and I was raised in newness of life in Christ. Not what I used to be. Hallelujah. And the cross is a devastating place. Hmm. There are people who will not agree with you. There are people who are not going to like you. It's not because you're not a likable person. They just don't like what you stand for. They don't like that you won't go out with them on Friday night and get drunk. They don't like with them that uh, uh, you won't carouse around and you won't uh, miss church for their activities or their events. Uh, 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 how many of you have heard uh, 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 when somebody invited you to do something, say, well, I just don't do that. I'm a Christian. And then they say, oh, you think you're better than me. No, we don't think we're better. We know what we were. Uh, we were sorry as the day is long. Uh, we deserve to go to hell. Uh, but I'm not going because of the mercy and the grace of Almighty God uh, because He saved me and changed me. Uh, it can be a devastating place. Can I say it can be a lonely place being saved? Hmm. Do you ever look around and you're struggling, trying to live right, trying to do right? It seems like everything you touch falls apart. You look around, these sinners living wicked as the devil, and everything they touch turns to gold. Well, do you think the devil just does point that out to you just to make you feel even lower? But friend, you need to get it in perspective. They're having their, they're having their heaven right now. Hmm. All they got waiting on them is the lake of fire. Hey, friend, but when we step out of this world into glory, do you realize to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord? Uh, do you realize all that heaven has to offer is ours? Uh, streets of gold, walls of jasper, gates of pearl. Uh, more important than that, we get to be with the God that made us, uh, the God that saved us, uh, and forever we'll be with the Lord. What a blessing! Uh, our, our heaven's to come. Hmm? Uh, but we have a duty. And being a child of God to carry our cross. And cross bearing, we're first of all to spread the light of Jesus. Folks ought to see that we're different. Not that we think we're better than anybody, they ought to just see something different in us. Uh, they ought to see it in our countenance. They ought to see it the way we talk, the way we walk, uh, how we uh, conduct ourselves, how we look, uh, everything about us. They ought to say, that crowd right there has been with Jesus. They ought to see His light in our life. In cross-bearing, we're not only to spread the light of Jesus, we're to show the love of Jesus. Can you imagine what kind of world this would be if every professing Christian would love like Jesus? There wouldn't have been people burning down cities last month, last year. No, they'd realize that all lives matter. Because Jesus died for yellow, black, red, and white. They're all precious in His sight. Hmm? Can I say there is no prejudice in the blood of Christ? God's people, we're to love like Jesus loves. You say, well, I don't like that person. I'm sure there were things Jesus didn't like about you, but He loved you anyway. Can I say this? There are days that there's things about myself I don't like. Hmm? We're to 
love like he does. Hmm. When you love like he does, you forgive like he does. And when you forgive like he does, you forget like he does. Hey, he forgives our sins never to be remembered anymore. Mm -mm. That's how I know there isn't any halos in here. We all need work on that. Mm -mm. Hey, we're to spread the light of Jesus. We're to show the love of Jesus, but we're to stand in the lordship of Jesus. If there's one thing that's a great indictment against Christianity today is folks won't stand. We need to stand not in the power of our might, but stand in the fact that He's Lord. Lord of lords and King of kings. And if He said it, that settles it, and I'm just going to stand on what He says. I don't preach to be popular. If you listen to me preach long, you'll understand I'm not very popular. I don't care what the world says is right. I care what Jesus said is right. And I don't care what the world says is acceptable. I care about what Jesus says is not acceptable. And as carrying our cross, there are sometimes we need to make stands on hard topics and stand there for. I don't care that the world embraces certain sins and deviations as being normal. The Word of God calls them an abomination. And we need to stand in the Lordship of Almighty Christ. God help us to carry out our duty because He carried out His for us. I wonder this morning... What does the cross mean to you? The last time you visited it. The last time you embraced it. When was the last time you was thankful for it? When was the last time you told him? You're so sorry he had to pay that price for you, but you are so thankful he did. The Lord was working with me on a thought on the cross before Miss Annette and I watched a movie the other night. But the movie dealt with the cross. It's one of the best movies I've seen in a long time. It was on Pure Flix. It's called Do You Believe? It was done very well. A lot of famous actors. One of my favorite childhood actors was there. He started out in westerns and then became the fall guy, Lee Majors. Everybody remember Lee Majors? Six Million Dollar Man? He ain't worth $6 million no more. He's like me. He's getting old. He's in it. Sybil Shepherd was in it. Bunch of folks, bunch of famous folks was in this movie. And it all dealt with all these lives being intertwined over the cross. And how many of them had believed on it. You know what was a blessing in that movie? Hearing Lee Majors pray over his food in Jesus' name. I hope he meant it from his heart. It sure didn't sound real. I know he's an actor, but I don't understand why actors would do a Christian movie if they didn't believe in the cross. I highly recommend it. Do you believe? Let me ask you today. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? Have you been to the cross by faith and realized he died for you? Have you put your faith in him? Friend, if you haven't, you can today. He'll save you from your sin today. Say, how do you know that? Because he saved me. If he saved me, he can save anybody. And he'll save you today. If you're here today and you're saved, when's the last time the cross impacted you so much that you made up your mind you're going to go shine your light for him? God, help us to be mindful of, because of the cross, I, I'm obligated to love others like he does. Because of the Christ, I'm obligated to stand when others won't stand. I wonder, how has the cross impacted your life? And are you willing to let it impact it so much you go out and impact somebody else's life? Because that's what the cross is all about, impacting lives.
Jesus has impacted yours. You're a debtor to the gospel. And you should have a desire that others, too, would be impacted by Jesus. I wonder this morning, how long has it been that the cross really meant something to you? Let's all stand, Brother Clint, if you'll come get a song of invitation. If God's spoken to your heart, we invite you to come. If you're here today and you're not saved, we invite you to come. Say, preacher, I don't know how to be saved. You come, we'll get somebody to take a Bible. We'll show you how to be saved. You can be saved today from your sins. If you're here today and it's been a while since you've been by the cross, you might want to come and get in this altar. You might want to come ask God to do something in your life. That revival starts in your soul today. You don't have to wait till next week. There are a lot of folks in the altar, but there's room for you, friend. We're going to pray. Father, help us today embrace the cross of Christ. Lord, help us to allow it to be used in our lives to impact others for Christ. And God, certainly, if there's somebody here that doesn't know Christ, I pray today would be the day of their salvation. God bless helping this invitation. We'll bless you for it, for it's in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.